How are you doing, Gabe? Doing well, Greg. How are you? I'm doing well. It's good to see you again. Um, so last week we were talking about Elkins and Saunders. Yeah. We kind of uh, made a broad argument that Elkins has a pretty vastly odd interpretation of what teaching is. And hence, because he has a very, uh, I would call it, content delivery idea for how teaching works, that he says you can't teach art because it's not a matter of delivering the right content. We generally agree with that, but we don't think that teaching is just that, that teaching is far more things than that. And so we do believe that art can be taught. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, so then we also talked about this strange story that George Saunders mentions in his book, A Swim in a Pond, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain. I call it now the parable of Stan. Yeah. What, what do you think of that parable? Yeah. So that's what you're referring to is that, that story about the man building the little model city and placing down a hobo and then slowly kind of tweaking his model city until without even kind of realizing it, he's created this, this kind of complicated love story between mm -hmm. two of his little model people in his, in his model world. And it's like on the one hand, it's, if we're going to agree with Saunders, which last week we seem to agree with him quite a bit, it's like, well, how do you teach that? Mm -hmm. And that's what today's conversation with Kenneth Steinbach's Creative Practices for Visual Artists subtitle, Time, Space, Process, mm -hmm. is trying to get at. Because especially if you're coming from an Elkins point of view and you hear this weird story, yeah. like you can understand like, yeah, somehow this Stan, as he's arranging his little model railroad set with his hobo, has this intuition. But how do you teach that intuition? Mm -hmm. How do you teach that vision, that, that noticing, and then that application of agency changing the domain. Mm -hmm. um, and Elkins is kind of on the side of, you can teach someone how to set up a model railroad train set. You can teach them how to make little miniatures, how to paint them, how to get the, electric, the electrical current in the rail to work, all of that. But you can't teach that thing where someone notices that there's a possibility, a potentiality for a love story. Right. He might even say that you can teach people about other love stories and show other people other love stories that have happened with similar model train sets. Yeah. But that's still not ever going to be enough to take a person to the point where they can make their own. And that's something innate. Yeah. Yeah. I hope he's wrong. <laughs> I hope um, for our sake. Yeah, for our <laughs> sake. So... Um, I wanted to start, this book, uh, well, how would you describe this book? Especially, like, it's kind of odd because it kind of contains, like, a syllabus inside of it. It does. Like, you're a student reading this book. What is it like for you? Yeah, so it's not, um, it's not, it's not like many other books that I've read. It's, it's so it's got this first part where uh, Steinbeck kind of lays out all of his, his, essentially his theory of how art works and how teaching art works and kind of the basic behind, I guess what I'll call the creative process, but we'll, I'm sure we'll get into that more, what he talks about being creativity and process. And then, like you said, there's this syllabus. He kind of outlines his, his class that he teaches. Yeah. And then he has a bunch of interviews at the end, just a bunch of kind of straight up and down. Right, um, right. This is how different artists do it sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, you're missing one key thing. So there's tons of books out there about how to teach art. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some really famous ones in the performance realm that are great. They're hilarious, they're weird, they're kind of cultish. And it's always looking at, let's find, like the, the general process is, well, we don't really know how to teach art. Mm -hmm. And Elkins has confirmed that. Yep. And, but what we do know is that there are good teachers of art. Let's ask them what they do. So then they explain their syllabi. Like there's, there's even whole, like, especially during COVID, there was like this whole movement on Facebook of tons of educators posting their syllabi, posting their workarounds, figuring out like, this is the goal of this project, learning outcomes and all mm. of this student learning outcomes, program learning outcomes, PLOs and SLOs. So like in my dreams, I, had, I played duck hunt and I just shoot, <laughs> I shoot three letter acronyms out of the sky. It's horrible. Um, and my dog refuses to pick up their carcasses. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he takes a very different point of view. And what he does is, I'm not gonna look at successful teachers. He says, I'm going to go to over 75 successful creatives. And he de defines success as 10 years after, uh, they have 
minimum of a decade of successful, consistent, creative work mm -hmm. that has sustained them in their field. So this might be designers, that means graphic designers or something like that, yep. but it's also commercial artists, fine artists, musicians, mm -hmm. like a bunch of different people that have had at least a decade of sustained creative success that has been their main job. Yeah. Not just like in, you know, they're, they're an accountant during the day and at night they paint in the garage. Yeah. Literally like these people who are seeming to make a profession or a livelihood out of it. And he interviews all 75 of them. And that's when he starts doing his own sort of uh, analysis of the interviews to find common themes of what are they doing. And then he creates a course to say, how do I teach the things that they're doing? Mm -hmm. Which is where this, this is altogether a very unique book mm -hmm. compared to most of the books out there when it comes to like, how do we teach art? Yeah. And I think that this book is a great counter to Elkins, but I just want to read, it's literally, I don't even know what to call this, like it's the first page inside the cover. Yeah. And also I will say if Ken is watching, um, the we need to work on the quality of the binding here. Um, <laughs> I have like tons of pages coming out and I don't know, but it's only my copy. My, of course, I get the copy that is I was going to say, like, I've, I've got a copy too. <laughs> it's almost like, mm -hmm. I'd say 30% of the pages are not attached to the binding. <laughs> oh, no. um, but anyways, the first two sentences of whatever this intro is, it, it literally is not in the table of contents, so I don't know what this is. This is contrary to popular belief, the practice of art isn't just a product of innate talent or artistic vision. He's firing shots at Elkins. Mm -hmm. um, artwork emerges from an intentionally constructed and maintained artistic practice. And then it goes on to describe developed from interviews from more than 75 mid-career artists and all that. But that like those that that sentence and then that clause, art emerges, artwork emerges from an intentionally constructed and maintained artistic practice is the running thesis of this book. Basically, mm -hmm. we can teach those things. And from that, art will emerge. Yeah. But we can't, ex we, we don't know what it's going to be. And we don't know how long it's going to take. But we know that these are the disciplines <clears throat> and practices of successful artists. And if you teach those disciplines and practices, then you'll start to make art. Yeah. One, uh, one thing that stuck out to me when reading this book um, is while it stands so strongly in contrast to uh, our friend Elkins and his his kind of manifesto of teaching art. Interestingly, en interestingly enough, it it has a lot of parallels between I would say so many other things. We talked briefly about spirituality and religion and how there's a lot of similarities between a spiritual practice and a creative practice. Yeah. But even this idea has kind of taken root in I'd say almost like pop culture or maybe what you'd call like business management culture, right? Where you have these authors like Malcolm Gladwell kind of championing the, the idea of the 10,000 hour rule. And, mm -hmm. you know, while there's debate of like, oh, 10, is 10,000 hours the right number? It's still that same idea of like, the most important part is showing up in some mm -hmm. ways. Like, like that's, a, that's an idea that has been latched onto in almost every other area, whether that's sports or business or, um, I mean, any, any skill, really, anything, gardening, farming, any kind yeah. of other sort of discipline, except for the arts, in which case people say it a lot and then maybe... Uh, well, it's prevalent throughout all academia that that kind of isn't empirical enough. Mm -hmm. So when I describe what I do, like there, there was this big, um, there's like this kind of training seminar that happens amongst faculty here that is all interdisciplinary and mm. I was a part of it and there was peers from natural sciences, psychology, sociology, some arts, um, but it was mostly like researchers, you know, set up a, set, you know, scientific method kind of thing. Mm. And they have no clue what I'm doing. Mm. And it was like in a matter of 45 minutes of me describing what I'm doing and what I'm going through, they were like all of them, a whole room of them were like, oh, this is really similar to what we do in research. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, exactly. It's a practice. Yeah. You have the scientific method. We have creative methods. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> we have creative methods. But those methods are still like, we're still human beings. We yeah. still look, 
perceive, interpret meaning, and assign value and direct our attention in the same manners, but it just looks different in different domains. Mm -hmm. And that's where like this kind of idea, um, I think it's the core of the liberal arts to a large degree, and I think it's what most schooling has lost post-enlightenment that Elkins is really picking up on, um, but it's, it was there originally. Almost all of our institutions of higher academia, higher education, even our public, uh, our public schooling education came out of this, but they, they were rooted in <coughs> an understanding of what the monastic contemplative life practice does and how it liberated a human being. And, and when I say liberated, I mean it gave them agency over their life in a manner that they, be, they began to understand how they could make changes and they wouldn't be, you know, kind of medieval, you were born a Thatcher, your last name's Thatcher. <laughs> that means you're gonna be a Thatcher. Yeah. Um, and, and so there was like a, it, it comes out, like education comes out of these traditions that are spiritual. Whether you agree with the theology doesn't matter. What, what I'm saying is the practice, the practice notion of it is, and it, it also aligns with someone we've mentioned a couple times, which we won't get to, but it, that is Rene Girard and his idea of learning through copying, through mimesis, mm -hmm. and specifically setting up models. And that what you're primarily doing as a learner is you're actually just imitating someone you designate as a model. And through the imitation of them, at some point in time, it suddenly becomes yours. Ah, maybe we do need to read with Gerard. There's a really good essay on innovation, and I don't know. We'll, well, I have a different idea for what we're going to read for next week, but maybe we have to do that. Since well, we maybe we'll switch it up. But, but what I was going to say, and I think we've, we've mentioned this idea, kind of talking again about the, the origins of teaching and learning things, but in the kind of the apprenticeship model, which we've talked mm -hmm. about a lot before, whether that's um, blacksmithing, where your first years as an apprentice are just making, you know, thousands of nails, or um, uh, like super common in a lot of Japanese apprenticeships or Japanese crafts, where like your, yeah. your first years and years and years of practice, you're just learning how to sharpen tools. Yeah. And, and what that is, is, you know, it's, it kind of strikes you as odd at first, but what that is, is it's a super effective way of teaching process. Like yep. that's what you're learning how to do is the process because the process of making nails is simple, but you're learning the process of your forge, you're learning the process yep. of your hammer. If you're a wood carver, you're learning the, the really important process of like doing the same thing every day, which is how you become right. successful. Right. That's why so much um, like yourself, I have a non-typical academic no, not a background that is non-typical for an academic, and mm. that is coming from a working class background mm. and you coming from a farm or yeah. not. It's like, I have learned so much from these old guys mm -hmm. who have done everything and they don't say a word, <laughs> but they, they look at me, they see what I'm doing, they make you know some sort of noise of judgment, <laughs> grab my tool and adjust slightly and do something and it's like, yeah, I didn't know that I, I didn't know there was a wrong way to hammer. Yeah, you know, like, yep. And and it's not that you can be told how to hammer. It's like you have to see it. You have to understand what you're doing different, and then you have to realize how to hammer. And then suddenly, a job that took you know tons of energy turns into a job that you can do all day because you've learned the efficient way of doing it. But it's like they didn't communicate anything to you in the sense of. There wasn't data that you needed, mm -hmm. that needed to be given to you, and then suddenly you could execute like a computer code. It's like, no, they had to model it. We had to copy it. You had to understand so many uh, nonverbal things about it. And that's what it's getting at is like, you don't actually need the data necessarily. <clears throat> the data can always help. What you really need is the model. Yeah. You need to learn the practice and process, and then suddenly, all of those other things that you might not even be able to verbally articulate, they still fall into place. Yeah. And this is like the thing with artists. You know, I'm always around people who like, like you're a highly literate art artist, as I think am I. But I've, I know lots of artists who it's like, they're functional, functionally dyslexic and unable to read, and yet they can do so much stuff. Mm. You know, in the sense of like academia, do they know what they're doing? No, but they can do it. Yeah. <laughs> It's a similar, your story about like, like having 
you know, the tool kind of taken out of your hands is the, the experience that I've had so many times is working with um, some old farmer who's probably like literally five or six times my age. Like, like at the time, like I would have been 14. So these guys who are much, much older than me and watching them do jobs faster, longer, and better than I could just effortlessly. Even though, you know, by all accounts, I'm a, uh, I was a 16 year old boy, I should have been able to run circles around these guys and watching them, you know, build a barn in like days and just be like, how, mm -hmm. how is that possible? And that's the experience that I've had so often when looking at art or looking at other artists working where it's like, I don't, I don't entirely know what you're doing differently, but I'm so obviously outpaced and all I can do is watch. Like you can try and tell me what the difference is between me and you, yeah. but at the end of the day, what I'm feeling is, oh, I'm, I'm outpaced here. I'm not. Right, right. And we're, we're picking up on like what Steinbach's picking up on to bring us back to the book. Yeah. But he has at the beginning of chapter one, I want to read a quote where he like, he identifies, see, look at, look at this, look at this, come on. <laughs> um, he identifies uh, a problem that yeah. he's experiencing as a college professor. And he, he kind of tells this whole story of someone he names as Angela. I think he's changed the names for privacy purposes. But um, talking about like, uh, you know, assigning a project in a 3D class and this student following him, him into the office and asking questions. I'll just read the second paragraph here, but I want to highlight the last sentence. But Angela followed me into my office and after pausing to take a seat, continued for several minutes with a series of polite but focused questions about my definition of interesting because he had assigned that they need to, he had said that they need to make something interesting. Mm -hmm. um, most of her questions revolved around how my grading rubrics were constructed and how I would be evaluating projects with criteria that were obviously subjective because what's interesting to Ken mm -hmm. is maybe not interesting to me. Yeah. You know? Uh, my attempts to encourage Angela to invest time experimenting with materials or drawings was declined on the grounds that she didn't like to start anything before she understood, before she under, oh, there's a typo here, uh, that she, she didn't like to start anything before she understood what was required and how she was going to complete it. Mm -hmm. It's like, She's thinking in the design process. You've taken my design classes yeah. and you've taken more creative classes with me. And I constantly talk about how the creative process and the design process are the same, except the design process starts with an end goal in mind. Mm -hmm. And when you're making art, it's very difficult. Well, I, I honestly think you can't make art with an end goal in mind. Um, that might be too extreme, but that's my extreme stance. But so she's thinking like a designer. Mm -hmm. Give me a target to hit. And then I'm going to explore and find my way to that target. Yeah. And Steinbach is saying, no, I don't, that, that you're, you're being a designer then. Yep. Yeah. I want you to just do something and let's see where it goes. Yeah. And she's paralyzed. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you, like, w when you were a younger student, did you ever identify with Angela? I, I think so. I mean, I... It's, it's a difficult question because I, I tend to, um, well, I came from an engineering background, which is like if you, if you talk about things kind of falling on a spectrum between art and design, engineering is, is all the way on this full, on the, on the fully design where it's like if you don't have a goal when you're engineering something, you're not engineering. Like the definition of engineering is, you know, we've talked about this before, applied science, you got to know what you're doing, Yep. so on and so forth. And that, um, I'll, I'll, say, I'll say one thing that's different between me and Angela is that I've never been entirely grade focused, right? I've never mm -hmm. been somebody who's cared very much about the, the end grade of a project, but I have always been like, oh, like what, what do I want this to look like? Like I'll yeah. have some sort of a finished idea in my head before I ever start making. Yeah. And um, more and more as, as I've kind of moved throughout the art, um, through our series of courses in this department, like the finished products look so different from those initial sketches, you know, where right. it's like something will start out as a drawing and I'll think it'll end up as a drawing and by the time it's done, it's a sculpture. By the time it's done, it's four sculptures or right, right. so on and so forth. I like to talk to students about, um, well, the difference between like really good graphic designers are actually artists who have done so much exploration. So a great example is um, 
Stefan Sagmeister. Mm. When Sagmeister and Jessica Walsh were together, every third year they would take a year off and they would only do artistic practices. Yeah. As the entire, like their entire design firm, right? Firm. Would just do a year of uh, whatever they wanted. Yeah, and they would they would come up with weird ideas, and then it's like they would bank them. And they would like have these ideas. They would do other things, like they created a movie. They they did exhibitions and all kinds of cool stuff. But then it was like when they went back to designing, and they get a client on board, and they're like, you know, a new whatever. They need to make a new logo for this theater or something. It's like they've got this huge library mm -hmm. of ideas that they just haven't they haven't directed them towards an end yet. Mm -hmm. And it's like they've already they, they're making it so that their design practice is kind of. Uh, leeching off of the artistic creative mm -hmm. practice. And it's so amazing. Yeah. Their work is so much better because when you don't have that, when you have Angela's focus of like, I need to know what I need to do, then I need to think up the idea. It's like, what? most people have like 10 good ideas. Yeah. Maybe, probably less than that. Yeah. And it's like, so then what are you gonna do? And, and he talks about this a lot later on when we get to the process or the process sort of thing and time and space is like, if you, if you only create when you have a need to create, you will stop creating. Mm -hmm. Because eventually you'll solve the majority of your problems. You know, like you'll get a job, you'll pay your rent, you won't need posters, yeah. you won't need paintings, and, and you won't need to be creative, and so you won't because you're, you're thinking of it as a means to an end. And right. the end goal is the thing that you need. Right. I mean, we. Uh, I mean, the, the the quote that comes to mind immediately is necessity is the mother of in, of invention. Right. Yeah. Like that's the perfect example. We make carts and axes and shovels because we need to move things and chop things down and dig. Right. Uh, nobody. I don't want to say nobody has ever needed a painting because I think everybody needs a painting, but not in the same way that you've ever needed a piece of bread. That's not how paintings work. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, that would be that's a much longer conversation. We can, we can but, talk about that a lot, but yeah, it is yeah. it is the same idea. of it's a it's a different way of making. You know, you're right. not you're not needing it to stay alive in the same way that yeah. you might need water or something right. like that. Right. So yeah, Steinbach is is identifying this same problem, this this idea, and he's trying to think about like I mean, it's similar to the problem that Elkins addresses. Mm. You know, Elkins is noticing that, like, just some students don't have it. <laughs> and they're not able to do this weird, without end goal in sight, yeah. exploration and play that might produce art. Mm -hmm. They need a project. They need an assignment. And Elkins points out, what we're doing with our assignments is not what Steinbach is advocating. It's far more that design thing, mm -hmm. you know? like. Paint a portrait of your. Do a self-portrait of yourself. Yeah. You know, make a photo project that explores light. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's it's always giving you an end goal. Mm -hmm. And we know this. Like we we do this as professors because maybe it's because we haven't been introspective enough as Steinbach has been about what we're doing as teachers, but also because we know that our students need something. They need something to bite onto, and so we try to give vague assignments. But at the end of the day, they're still that. And mm -hmm. then at the end of the day, you have tons of students like Angela. I think almost all students these days start off like her, mm -hmm. unless they've been raised by artists or something. Yeah. Um, who, you know, they need, what, what do you mean? What does it need to look like? What are the size requirements? Mm -hmm. How many hours do I need to spend on it? Yeah. If I don't spend on it, how much will it impact my grade? Yep. All of the worst questions, in my opinion, yeah. to ask in the sense of like what you're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, I always, I mean, you've seen me in class. I'm always so coy when those questions come up <laughs> of like, I don't know. What do you, you know? The, the question of my favorite is your answer to how much, how much time will it take? And you almost always go, how much time do you think it should take? You know, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. always the answer. Yeah. Right. It will take as much time as it needs to take. Oh, just make it good. Uh, people are like, oh, come on. Don't, don't tell me that. <laughs> Oh, it's horrible. It's horrible. Um, so Steinbach, in, in the first chapter, he has a subheading called A New Approach. And he's trying to get around this. And he says, the first paragraph is, after identifying these forces, helping students respond to them seem to require more than an occasional conversation within the classroom. He's talking about these forces, because the whole chapter, the beginning of the chapter, addresses like, why are our students like this? He's basically like, well, our culture is like this. Mm -hmm. So identifying these cultural forces. 
He's like, it can't just be an occasional conversation in the classroom. It's clear that these problems represent deeply seated behaviors and reactions that have been developed in response to years of social, parental, and academic forces that were not likely to be dispelled by a lecture or two. I felt a more long-term interventionist approach was needed. So with little more than a title and an inkling of an idea, I proposed creative practices, as that's capital C, capital P, creative practices class to address these new challenges. So he's basically saying like, he noticed these things and he realized I have to come up with something that is getting around this by being a completely different class. Hmm. Um, how, like, just if you were to give your 10,000 foot view, you know, what is that class? What's that new approach? How would you describe it? Compared to like, I don't know, an, an engineering class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think the biggest thing that stands out about that class is that the requirements are almost entirely based on how much, how much time are you spending in your studio, right? Like mm -hmm. that's like the biggest difference, which um, to, to draw a comparison with that to engineering. In engineering, the most successful students are the students who can do things the quickest and the most accurately. Like that's, yeah. that's your greatest advantage in an engineering class is being able to do math faster than anybody else. Mm -hmm. And this is pushing against that where it's saying, I don't care how good you are or how fast you are at drawing or sculpting or whatever you need to be putting your 10 hours in regardless. Like yeah. that's, your, that's, your, that's your goal mm. is to do this for this amount of time. That's a really interesting distinction because so often, um, I was just talking to my wife about this, how uh, there's something weird in art departments. I've seen that not just here at Hope College, but at many of the institutions I've taught at where um, freshmen come in and you have these ones that have just amazing talent, talent greater than my own, mm. especially in something like drawing, um, drawing and painting and whatnot. And they come in and they are so good at it and they can get their homework done like in class, you know, and mm -hmm. spend no time outside the studio. And so for those first one or two years, they're making some of the best work. But then when it suddenly, like, like I said, eventually your ideas run out, you, mm -hmm. Like we're not very deep people, especially 18 to 20 year olds yeah. in our culture are not very deep people. Yeah. And so in that sense of like, if all of the ideas have to come from here and they don't have a way of discovering good ideas, they'll run out of those ideas pretty quickly. And I often find that in the senior year, when it comes to like the culmination of, of a student's education, oftentimes those students who came in as extremely talented could just do it without trying, they're not making very good work by their senior year. They haven't, they, they didn't have to work hard in their early years. They didn't have to put in the time. And then when they started getting challenged finally in that third and fourth year, when really the answer is put in the time, they didn't have the discipline to do that. Mm -hmm. And so they, they didn't have, and then you have these other students who it's like, man, you see them freshman year and you're like, oh, oh. Yeah, not very great, um, <laughs> but they're diligent and they stick with it and they stick with it. And then suddenly by their senior year, it's like, wow, you're making some great work. Mm -hmm. You know, like you in your freshman and, and sophomore year, you might not have understood what you were doing, but you were developing a habit of putting in the time mm -hmm. of sitting there and thinking. Cause the reality is like, you know, take digital design for, as an example. Every single composition you're making, every time you move something in Photoshop, you've made a new composition. Hmm. And every time you're sitting there thinking, most of the time, if you're me, you're thinking, well, that's garbage, that's garbage, that's garbage, stupid Greg, stupid Greg. <laughs> and then suddenly you're like, oh, wait, what's that? Yep. You know, like you move, when it's there, it's not bad. And, uh -huh. then, and then you start, oh, this is, this is terrible, terrible, terrible. And it's like, you go through, like in the matter of however much time you sit there, yep. you're going through hundreds, if not thousands of compositional ideas and suddenly you arrive somewhere. And so it's like, if you're that student who sits down and for some reason, because of your innate talent and creativity, 10 compositions in, you come up with something good, bam, I'm out of here. Yeah. That other student got to see 100 or 1,000 compositions and you made 10. Mm -hmm. And it's like you can see, you know, they might have started way down here compared to that student, but every time they're growing like this and this student's growing like this. And it's like by the end, they're up here because they have this practice of challenging themselves, of putting in the time. Mm -hmm. And then 
they just exceed. And this person eventually decides this is too hard. This is too much work. I did this because I thought it would be easy. Hmm. And they end up crumbling. Yeah. It's an interesting... I don't know, the, the paradox of being kind of naturally super talented at something, right? It's, yeah. it's a, a gift and a curse in so many ways. And I think a lot of, um, well, it's, it's a big conversation in academia right now where people are talking about gifted, gifted kid burnout. Have you heard about this term? No. <laughs> it's this idea of that like children who are told that they're super, super talented, super, super gifted all through grade school and elementary and junior high and even sometimes high school, oftentimes struggle immensely in college, where it's like, if you're the sort of person who for whatever reason learned to read three times as fast as your, as your, you know, your peers, and you were told that you're a genius, yeah. by the time that you hit high school, everybody knows how to read just as well as you, and you're like, you're burnt out because you can't, you yeah. can't kind of handle whatever that level of stress is that's being placed on you now. There's all kinds of reasons why that happens. That's so problematic. I think so. I think it's a complicated issue, but it, it, yeah. it does get at something where it's like, well, you know, honestly, the, the difference between a student who learned how to read super fast and took, you know, an extra, an extra couple minutes, like how you treat those two students matters infinitely more than the fact that one of them just somehow got phonics or had a natural understanding of how, how the written language works. Yeah, yeah. That's why, the, so, uh, I, I don't want to go too far into my critique of American education systems in <laughs> particular. Uh, Steinbeck but, uh, doesn't, doesn't worry about that. He comes, he names <laughs> bills by name in this book yes, that he's yeah, like, this was a bad idea. <laughs> right, right. Especially like, no child left behind. Yeah. Horrible. I'm so glad that I generally dodged that in my, in my, uh, path yeah um but at its core you can see like um it's hard to to uh, most people think like iq is like people's ability to remember things mm -hmm. and to compute data and like oh i can read this book and hold it all it's like it's not really that it's more like your ability to recognize patterns, mm -hmm. understand how a pattern functions, and then reuse that pattern. Mm -hmm. That's why almost all good cross-cultural IQ tests are visual and not linguistic. Mm -hmm. The reason being is, um, well, you, you, run out of, you run into problems when you go cross-cultural with it because you have to figure out how to translate logic into other languages, but other languages use logic differently. Yeah. Whereas visual puzzle, puzzles are pre-linguistic mm -hmm. and so we're what we're testing in iq is someone's ability to recognize patterns understand them and predict the next outcome yeah and it's like when you describe iq as that it's like oh man that means so many different things than usually what we mean when we say someone's smart mm -hmm. and so a child <clears throat> who's able to learn reading much faster than someone else they've figured out the patterns and understand how to predict them even if they can't explain them. And that's actually a good way of understanding if a child is learning properly is they can't actually explain what they know, but they can model it. And again, it gets back to Girard, it gets back to how we learn. It's not, they're not told what the letter A means. It's like they're given the letter A in a bunch of contexts where it's being used properly. And then suddenly it's like they kind of have it. And then once they finally receive the data of the alphabet and the A for apple and B for bear and all that stuff, mm -hmm. suddenly it's like, oh, yeah, this makes sense. This is what I've been doing. And so it's like we don't think of that. We think this student has a capacity for giving more information. It's like, no, they have a capacity for recognizing patterns. Put more patterns in front of them. Teach them a system, like teach them another language. Throw in a musical instrument. Give them, t tell them creative writing. Have them start painting. Mm -hmm. That student is going to be a genius. But instead we're like, that means they can go on to more in books that have more words. Mm -hmm. It's like you're not, you're not actually, you're not actually uh, taking advantage of what that student's innate ability is. It's not an ability to memorize more facts. You know, I think about like the, there's a great movie called Magnolia. It's my favorite movie of all time where there's a kid in it. His name is, uh, it's played by, ah, I forget who he's played by. It's a great actor. Um, but he's like the whole, his whole part of the story is about how he's this whiz kid who won this like uh, quiz show when he was a child that beat adults and all this stuff. And now he's an adult and it's like none of those trivia questions matter. 
and it's like he didn't he didn't understand what his skill was. I mean, it's all fictional, but yeah. you know, you can imagine this happens to a lot of people. It's like you didn't understand what your skill was. Your skill wasn't retaining trivial information. It was figuring out like you you understood how to uh, keep that information in your head. That's the skill, hmm. not the knowing of the things. Yeah, you know, it's like back to Walker Percy, and it's like message in a bottle. It's like you have a knack not for maintaining as many bottles in your mind as possible, but understanding how to remember all the bottles. Or, or like, like understanding which bottles should just be like literally just tossed right back into the ocean yeah, right away. Like, exactly. Not only will I never, like not only is this not important right now, I don't think it'll ever be important. And right, just... right, yeah. Like what the trivia show does is it tests not your ability to hold all this information and then judge it and weigh it, but rather how much information can you hold? Mm -hmm. It's like, who cares how much information you can hold, especially in the time of silicon chips? Yeah. Like, we don't need that. Right. What we need is how do you make good judgments in response to those? And so it's like, if you put that person, you know, a person over a really complex um, organization, they have to hold all of these spinning plates in balance. That's what that person's skill was. And instead, he thought his skill was being famous. And so, like, his whole character arc is how he didn't realize what his skill was, and now he's squandered it, and he's, like, alone in bars drinking all the time. Yeah. There's still a redemptive narrative, but you can see that kind of thing happening even in that narrative. Right. Yeah, we've had... Me and my grandma had this conversation recently where we were... I'm, I'm pretty good friends with my grandma, and one of the things we talk about pretty frequently is technology because um, she's remarkably tech-savvy for... Uh, for the grandparent of a 23 year old. Um, but still there are some things that like, there are just these obvious generational disconnects. And one of those things that the most, the funniest one to me is using a search engine, mm. which you don't, you don't necessarily realize is a skill mm -hmm. until you see somebody who can't do it, which is my grandmother, like God bless her, where the question of how do I find the information that I need when there is literally infinite infinite information available is something that everybody in my generation can do almost effortlessly. Mm -hmm. Like they understand how a search engine works. They know it doesn't need to be a complete sentence. They know you're just like, what are the best keywords? How can I just fill this bar up and, I'll, and I can get it in my top hit? Where as I've seen other people who treat it like you're talking to something where it's like mm -hmm. these long drawn out questions and we've, We've had this conversation a lot of times because it shows how differently we view information and learning, where it's like yeah. that, that skill of pattern recognition is just one that I've grown up with, yeah. and it's a different, it's a different well, way of looking at it. Think about the two problems there. Uh, we're kind of getting off the side, but it's such an interesting... Yeah. Anyways, uh, how do you get information? Your grandma grew up in a time where the way you got information was from people. Mm -hmm. So what she learned were skills on how to interface with a human being yeah. to get the information you need, which mm -hmm. means pleasantries, conversation, mm -hmm. full sentences. Yeah. Your generation has learned how to get, the main way to get information is through web queries yep. and soon AI queries, yeah. all of this stuff. And it's not, it's about keywords, it's about figuring out what is the combination of keywords that's trying to get at my actual question, which you might not even know your actual question, but your grandma is starting with the question and she doesn't quite know what the keywords are about it, which is why she can't, it's hard for her to transition mm -hmm. to speaking to the computers. But then again, in general, your generation doesn't know how to talk to people. No, that's 100% the, the truth, which is, we, we've talked about this a little bit where it's like some sometimes I'll be talking to somebody who's, we're talking about the generational gap between even me, a 23 year old and like an 18 to 16 year old, where I've yeah. had conversations with people who kind of should be my peers. An 18 year old should be my peer in some ways because we're both in college at the same time yeah. and being like, oh, we're just, we're different species at this point. <laughs> like this is, this is ridiculous. Yeah. It's very strange. Very strange. Well, I mean, you grew up on a farm, like you're, you're an outlier in your in a your bit. generation yeah already. yeah but i think it's also something that me and my my friends have realized like even like my yeah. my little sub generation of like you know my group of friends who all got married this summer like mm -hmm. that kind of like very narrow band where we're all like yeah what the heck is going on with our younger siblings like what the heck is like the four years younger than us group doing because yeah they're 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 a different breed like we they're different
It's Fortnite, man. <laughs> so all Fortnite. <laughs> um, this gets to, so like on page 19, when he's talking about like, so he's identifying all these problems, all these behaviors as he talks about that we have. How do we break this? How do we teach this artistic creative practice? And he says, the artist's job is to search for the seed of the next great idea. But, but uh, sorry, the artist's job is not to search for the seed of the next greatest idea, but to cultivate my God, oh, fresh start. We're, yeah, we're gonna one. we're gonna have to edit this. Um, the artist's job is not to search for the seed of the next great idea, but to cultivate the soil out of which new work emerges. Crafting such an environment requires supporting one's practice with defined spaces of time, feeding oneself with ideas, working a physical process, and commitment towards open-ended results. Given this environment creativity shows up. So th that's like the big broad summary of what he's going to do. Um, and I want to dive into those specifically in the same order that he addresses them in his, in his first uh, in his chapters two through five. Um, because it, like that's very unique. Mm -hmm. It's just different than most art classes. Hopefully you've seen this in a little bit of my classes, but yeah. um, even still I'm in a system that is generally opposed to the radical nature of Steinbach's ideas. I mean, at the end of the day, you still have to give us a midterm and there's a course evaluation and all these things. Yeah, like there's things that I hate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, and before that, I want to read on, he has slightly before this, he has another quote about, um, like his subheading is the real art. <laughs> My pages fall out here. Um, but so he's getting at solving this problem. Um, he says, in contrast to such a problem-solving mentality, an artistic practice generates work and ideas organically through an interactive and sustained process, where the focus of problem-solving is on specific and conclusive solutions. The focus of an artistic practice is larger and more expansive and includes far more speculative work and research not immediately applied to the making of the project at hand. Creating and maintaining a practice is, to a large degree, about establishing a new way of thinking and working and then feeding that process. Days and weeks are spent investigating visual ideas, experimenting with materials, and reading about their subject. Time is spent dwelling with the work and ideas in the studio in order to understand it in very deep ways. You can see, if he's right, that is hard to do in the context of teaching. Mm -hmm. It's because we got a 16-week semester, Students are taking four other classes. They're supposed to have three credit load of time in class and homework. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's, that, that's not much time. No, they don't. Those two things are at odds. And he, he even talks about some of the other issues, which is, um, you know, like students who are, the increasing number of students who have a part-time job. Like he goes into all of these reasons why essentially our academic our, our academic system and our system of teaching art are at odds, like yeah. criminally at odds with each other. Right. But he's still right. He's right about this core idea of time and process and space. Well, and I hope it's encouraging for you as a student to know that you're getting the beginning of the model and then you're going to practice that after this. Mm -hmm. Hope College and all liberal arts colleges, but Hope College is not the first to say this, but all liberal arts colleges talk about becoming a lifelong a lifelong learner. Yeah. And it's like, it's not like, a, you know, I was reading a C.S. Lewis once and he was talking about a peer and he was like, I certainly can say he's well-educated. And I sit there and I think, ooh, I don't know <laughs> if I can say I'm well-educated. Hmm. And then I think about like, you're going, you know, my students are going through higher ed. Would I ever say any of them are well-educated? It's like, what I mean by that is, I, I would call it somewhere along the lines of wisdom, where it's the proper application of the knowledge and practices hmm. that allow for wisdom. And it's like, well, no one, is, their, your education is not complete when you get a degree. Rather, ideally, you're immersed for four years in an environment where you might learn that becoming educated is a lifestyle. It's, hmm. a, it's a practice. It's a matter of asking questions to the world of looking at the world slightly differently, of realizing that there could be more, that something could be more than it seems, and then following your curiosity, 
learning how to research deeply. You know, there are skills there, but so much of it is this practice of becoming a curious, interesting person mm -hmm. who doesn't just like wait to be told what to do. Right. And that's, that's where it's like, hopefully there's encouragement in knowing that, and I think Steinbach gets at this of like the best thing, that we would better serve our students if we would start teaching the model rather than focusing solely on the accessible skills, the learning outcomes that we can measure <laughs> with assessment tools that we upload as PDFs at the end of the semester from a randomized selection of students that then someone looks at and decides that's quality work from that department. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, so I was, I was lucky enough to actually get to talk to, to Ken Steinbach once. Um, when he came and he juried a show here at Hope yeah. College, and I, I got invited to to get dinner with him and another professor afterward. I remember asking him essentially like, oh, if you had one piece of information as me just kind of starting out in the art department, what would you say to me? And he said, if you're thinking of yourself as taking separate classes, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. He said like, that's the number one piece of advice I can give you is think about every semester, every year if you can as a singular class. Yeah. That's to trying to teach you one thing. Treat it like that. Don't plagiarize, obviously, because you can't submit work between classes as <laughs> the same work. But that kind of idea of you're learning one thing every semester. Try and figure out what that one thing is, and figure out how these these how your English class, your religion class, your printmaking class, and your sculpture class are all right. the same class. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, even if you take something like my design classes. We talk a lot about posters because mm. posters are a great way to think about user interaction. Yeah. Um, and so it's like, you're going to make some posters. You could just make some posters. Or what you could think about is, in the sense of what I'm doing as a creative person, how does poster making change and impact what I'm interested in? You know, and like you're really interested in symbols and typography and uh, symbolism and meaning and all that. And it's like, well, that, you know, when you started making posters, there were ways that I could see you exploring with forms and shapes that you had in other parts of your practice. You know, and like, you're by no means perfect at doing this, but you excelled at that, where it's like, I could see that you weren't just making a standalone poster. Like, I'm gonna make a Wes Anderson movie poster because I like Wes Anderson. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, you're gonna make a poster that relates to all the other things you're doing, but it's like you're taking something you're mulling over in the studio mm -hmm. and you're moving it and you're 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 viewing it from the lens of what is a poster. Yeah. But we're we're getting ahead of ourselves. The first thing he says, he really has this question, and I just mentioned it. But he basically is like, what is the studio? So in the sense, the first first chapter after he defines his problem is about space. Yeah. What does he get at in space? How would you how would you frame all that? He defines the studio as a lot of things, and all of his ideas are really really interconnected because on, on, on some level I might even say that he defines the studio as a place a place to spend time like the studio is just the location in which you're kind of choosing to spend your time yeah um, he talks about it I think I think the studio is where honestly most it becomes most there's the strongest parallels between uh, contemplative religious practice and artistic practice because he talks a lot about ritual and he talks a lot about um, treating it as a sacred space I would say almost where he mm -hmm. talks about these things where he talks about successful artists who have these rituals where it's like the first thing you do when you get into your studio no matter what is you sweep the floor like a very mm -hmm. ritualistic practice but that's like that's what you do and then you you promise yourself that you're not gonna leave the studio for four hours and you're not gonna have your phone on you, and it doesn't matter what else you do. Like, you mm -hmm. just have to be in there for four hours, and you have to sweep the first thing you do. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if that helps answering the question of what a yeah. studio is, but it kind of it kind of right. creates the shape around it. No, right, it gets at it. He, he kind of says three specific things. One is, it's a physical space, mm -hmm. it's a space in time, and also it's an interior space, mm -hmm. which you're getting at. It, you you said that in a, uh, in a narrative manner, mm -hmm. but he's like, you have to have a physical space. For some people, like writers, that's like this coffee shop with my laptop. Yep. For some people, it's you know like visual artists. It's a big room where you can make a mess. Yeah. Um, you know, and sometimes like for me, my first studio outside of school was a 
basement space that had no light and a dirt floor. And uh, I wasn't actually supposed to pe be in there, but no one ever checked in this building because the building was literally falling down. <laughs> in the basement, I could see the floor above me sagging um, like a foot. Uh, but I could put my stuff in there and I could put a lock on this door mm -hmm. and then when I needed to work I would unlock the lock and drag everything into the back alley behind the building and that's where I would work is in mm -hmm. the back alley. Mm -hmm. So it's like, but I needed that space. You know, like sometimes I've had smaller studios, it's just a desktop. But it's like th that designated place where you engage in this practice, where when you're sitting there, it's wrong for you to have the other distractions. It's wrong for you to answer your emails, to turn on Snapchat or whatever it is you kids mm -hmm. are doing these days. <laughs> um, you know, it's like you need to have a physical space. Yep. And it's like that, but that is self-defined. But you have to like be intentional about it. Yeah. Otherwise, you let other things take over. Like, you know, if I've done this before. I've had a computer in my studio that had a video game on it. And it's like... That's not a studio anymore. No, right? like I'm, I, you're bored in the studio. You're like tired of looking at this garbage. You're angry because none of it's working. And then it's like, oh, but I could just go get that rapid dopamine hit of mm -hmm. playing a video game. It's like that I'm no longer in a studio. Yeah. I'm in a gaming room. Yeah. Not to say gaming rooms are bad, but it's like you, you need that space. Yeah. What was he saying? Like uh, time, I think, is also pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, talks a lot about... Um, I mean, mainly about just just treating your time with respect. Mainly, I think is like his his biggest point with it, where it's like, or I guess I guess you could say like defending the time that you set aside for your creative practice. Yep. Um, which yeah, I think that is pretty self explanatory. But basically, right. like he talks about a lot of different methods that people do to employ this. But it's it's all the standard things that we associate with productivity. Like set a timer, to block it out on your calendar. Here's how you. Yep. Here's how to actually like make sure that you're in there at this time. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's what you can see in the sense of when we were talking a little bit about his syllabi for his class. Mm -hmm. So the school provides the studio space for the students. Yep. And then he grades them based on the time. You are going to come in here and you're going to log the time you're in here. Yeah. And you're going to be in here without your distractions. I think he allows them to listen to music on headphones. Yeah. But they're like not supposed to use their cell phones. They're mm -hmm. not supposed to do those things. Yeah. They're supposed to sit there with some sort of process and work on that for that amount of time. And that's what he's primarily grading them on, is not what did you make, it's were you here putting in the time. He wants to know, are they working the practice muscles? Mm -hmm. Are they disciplining themselves to show up? Because, and, and then it's like the talented students, like they will face the same boredom. They might make something really cool in the first 10 minutes, They've still got the four hours. Yeah. You know, and so they'll sit there and okay, then maybe they'll learn like, oh, like once my ideas run up, run out, I don't I don't make anything else. Or maybe they'll start to figure out like, you know, I can like make more. Mm -hmm. So I can do a hundred of these things in four hours. Yeah. But then you'll also see the students who are slower, it's like they start to ramp up. You mm -hmm. know, they spend four hours in there and it's like, oh, they, you know, it took them half an hour to make their first thing. And their second thing took 15 minutes. Yeah. And then it's like, boom, 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 boom. And it's like, some people are like this and some people are like this. Yeah. But it's like, you got to figure that out. And some people are like this. Yeah. And sometimes you're both. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that's important to learn about yourself is like, you know, if, if just from a time management perspective, if you know that everything you're going to get done in your studio happens in the first three hours and then there's like, you know, two hours of uselessness and then maybe you'll kick something out at the end, like... Well, maybe maybe if you're you're just choosing the time that you want to be in there, like and you have limited time in a day, you say, okay, three hours is enough because I don't want to spend my two hours of of garbage time. I don't want to do my two yeah. hours of, of making nothing. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So then, what is this interior space? What's he talking about there? You you connected it a little bit with a spiritual practice. What was he meaning by that? Right. I mean, it's a it's a cliche, but what he's talking about is essentially a, a state of mind. Um, it gets called so many different things in kind of our, our culture today, but entering some sort of a place of focus, entering a place of willingness to work, I would say. Um, it shares, the way he describes it, I think obviously shares a lot in common with our ideas of either meditation or I've heard a lot of people talking about this thing that they call like flow state recently, which is like some area where you're 
your interest and your difficulty are kind of like meeting at the correct point. Yeah. But basically, it's that, that point that you've experienced at some, some time where you're in the best place to do work. Like mm-hmm. you're just working and you're not, you know, getting sidetracked every 30 seconds. You're not, yeah. you're not just sitting there bored. You're not so frustrated that you can't work. Right, right. It's a little bit, flow state is a little bit broader than that, but I get what you're saying. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he's talking about this. Uh, so when he introduces, he calls it interior space and silence. Successful artists also create an interior space or silence that isolates the work from agendas that would tell the artist what the work should be before he or she begins making it. He talks about like that, that kind of meditative practice. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, um, it's again one of the things that I think, um, at least Elkins when he wrote the book, you know, it's been a long time, so I don't know, maybe he's embraced Buddhism or something. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe he's embraced contemplative practices, but he didn't seem to have a window into what a contemplative practice was. Yeah. And it's like, when you're meditating, when you're in prayer, you're setting off and you're trying to literally get rid of your agendas so that whatever is supposed to happen might arise. Mm-hmm. Whether you think that's coming from a spiritual place or a subconscious place, doesn't matter. Everyone who practices this genuinely experiences something where it's like, I didn't realize that that's what I should be thinking about. I didn't realize why I was thinking about these things. It's like, it comes from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And in a similar manner, if you approach the studio space in that manner, suddenly you get that thing that Stan is having, where suddenly you're sitting there and like, well, I've been making all these logos or all these posters and playing around with these things. And suddenly it's like, oh, wait a minute, look at that. Where'd that come from? Hmm. That's an idea that I didn't think of and it's better than anything I can think of. And it's like, that's that interior space, that like listening, that silence, that get, that, you know, letting, putting on mute all the voices in the studio and all of the agendas, all of the feelings of I wanna make something good, I wanna make something powerful. And it's like, just sit and look around, mm-hmm. see what's there. But it's like, you gotta have, you gotta have the model train set. You have to have put in the time you got to have the domain created. Otherwise, when you're looking, there's nothing there. It's an empty table. Right. Yeah. And, and I think uh, to feel like oftentimes we try and relate things back to other ideas in these conversations. And a, a commonly misunderstood idea that is actually what he's hitting on here is the, the ancient Greek idea of like the muse or being visited mm-hmm. by the muse. Yep. Where it's like it has this massive misconception that the muse will just come down randomly, right? Yeah, just yeah. and like strike you with inspiration or inspirational hit from the gods and you'll be able to make something great. And that's not at all the case. If, if that, we could talk a lot about divine inspiration and work, but if whatever you want to call the muse, the work you have to put in is like preparing yourself, right? This creation of an interior space yeah. that you can have this, this experience. Yeah. I, every, I always go back to the Phaedrus. Everything's in the Phaedrus. Um, yeah, we don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> um, it, it is, that idea is deeply rooted in the Phaedrus. And it's, it's like this, yeah, I mean, well, this, this uh, quote that I want to read on page 29. Yeah. Often believing that simply being dedicated or ambitious or being a good enough artist or finding the right idea will be enough to keep them motivated, students motivated, working regardless of the environment they create for their practice. While this may work for a piece or two, or even a large body of work, it is rarely sustainable over a long period of time. Trying to force an art practice into one's life without making time for it often results in its slow death, as it has, the constant, it has to constantly battle for the artist's time and attention in a world filled with other obligations and opportunities. It seems that there is always something more interesting going on, particularly if the work in the studio is not going well. The ancient idea of the muses, all of that is that they're always there. Mm -hmm. It's us who don't pay attention. And this is the same thing in prayer, the kind of, you know, in the Christian idea of prayer of like quieting yourself and listening to the still small voice. It's like those, that God, that thing is always there. It's just, it's you who's not listening. Mm And so it's like in the studio, things are happening. I used to have this quote and I can't remember where it came from. I can't find it anymore. But it was, something might happen in your studio today. Make sure you're there to see it when it does. Hmm. And it's like this sense of like, there's something else happening here and I'm witnessing it. Hmm. And I might be involved in it. I'm certainly involved in it in my studio. I'm constantly throwing things around. But it's like, 
I'm not as in charge of it. It's not as much my agency. It's much more like I'm a spectator and I need to pay attention or I'll miss it. Hmm. And I often think I miss most of the things that happen in there. <laughs> um, but that's that kind of, you know, this is his time and space chapter, which is one of the subtitles before yeah. we get to process. But he's talking about like a, a great intentionality, a disciplining. It's like, we can teach that. That's what we teach to sports players and Olympians. Yeah. They have to be taught how to think, how to live a life that makes room for this sort of thing. It's like all of that is teachable, and he's trying to teach that. And that's where, like, to, to you know, continually combat Elkins. I really do think that this is the book that is the antecedent to Elkins. Um, but then, so disciplining the, the physical time and space, he has this next chapter on research and embodied knowledge. What were you gathering from? You know, what is embodied research? Yeah, so as with everything in this book, it, it all fits back into process. So he, he's talking about research less in kind of the way that, certainly not in the way that we talked about with um, how art works with like, you know, peer reviewed studies, certainly not that sort of research. And well, it can include that, it but can it include is that. not exclusive. Not that. exclusive. Yeah, 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 sorry. Um, and it's, it's also, um, well, yeah, I think I think putting it as a, a research process is the best way to put it because it, it's so broad. But he, what he's yeah. talking about is this. I think what I'd say is he he lays he lays down a case that creativity requires a lot of input, right? Like mm-hmm. there needs to be this like kind of in this constant intaking of information. Yeah. And he goes about a process that he believes is like the most successful and kind of encompassing for that input. Like how am yeah. I how am I taking in all this stuff and allowing it to uh, and allowing it to affect my process in some ways or yeah. allowing it to kind of regenerate inside of me? Right. One thing you'll, you've probably noticed since you've been in a lot of critiques with me is like, um, well, lots of people when they critique work, they'll ask a question that is something like, what were your intentions? Mm-hmm. Do you ever hear me ask that? No, the first question you always ask is, what are, what are we looking at, right? right. I, always, <laughs> I always start with the audience. Yeah. What are we looking at? Usually when I turn to the artist, I usually ask some form of, why did you do this? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm trying to get at, where were you going? Yeah. What was the thing that you were like, uh, you know, I'm going to start 3D printing weird pipe fittings to try to make like a hexagonal yurt like structure <laughs> yes i'm like why yeah like, why did you want to do that yeah i'm never what were your intentions i'm like why like where were you what was the thing where you were like i i want to work with pvc i want to use my 3d printing skills you yeah. know i'm always trying to get at not what were you intending to do but rather why was this even a possibility mm-hmm. you didn't have to work in 3d printing and, you, I, and I won't ever again. <laughs> but, but, right. I, when you said 3D printing skills, I was like, oh, man. But, um, yeah, but, but you know, like what I'm trying to get at there is um, I'm trying to empathize uh, and I'm trying to understand where you're at. What, like, what is, what are the inputs? What, you know, why did this thing get your attention. Right. And I love when students often think I'm trying to get at the intention question and I often have to have to like no 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 you're telling me too much. Yep. I want to know like do you like the color blue? Yeah. Is that what you're and, and they're like yeah, I do like the color blue. Why do you like it? Mm-hmm. You know like I always go down this weird chain of what seem like super mundane questions. And like with one of with one of your peers, this turned into an amazing conversation where it was like uh I don't. I, I'll I'll just say that I'll I'll kind of um, make it more. What is the word? Uh, ambiguous. Okay. Uh, ambiguous. Yeah. Uh, I, oftentimes, when I do this with students, it's like their motivations they haven't really thought through. Hmm. It's also why like therapy works. But it's like they're drawn to something. They don't really know why. They start working in a realm, and suddenly they you know when I start asking these questions. They start to realize things like, you know, when I walk into um, a library, all I can think about is like these these people poured their minds into these books and they're sitting there closed. It's like a bunch of closed minds. 
and I was drawn to working with text because it's like when you open a book, you open someone's mind. Mm -hmm. I've never heard anyone actually say that to me. I'm, I'm changing it. Yeah. But, you know, it's like that kind of thing where it's like, now that's weird. Yeah. Like not many people look at a library and think there's a bunch of like closed faces. Yeah. I'm like, start making those drawings. Yeah. You know, it's like that's the kind of... Uh, the kind of like when when he's when he's ta so embodied research is now like a peer reviewed thing by the way uh, I cite it in all of my grant proposals <laughs> but embodied research is getting at a form of research where you are self aware of your body's reception of things mm -hmm. so he breaks it into three categories but the first one he says is you need a physical skill yep you know like he's talking about a craft and. I like to talk about this a lot. Like I, the first thing I learned to build with was wood. I did a bunch of construction. I did a, you know, hanging fences. I hated my father for it, but now I thank him mm -hmm. um, enough that like whenever a problem comes to me, I want to make a chapel. I want to make a sculpture. Immediately, my mind goes to how do I make this with wood? Mm -hmm. It's like I think in terms of wood, mm -hmm. and that's what he's getting out of. Like when you've developed a skill, when you've developed a process. Um, suddenly it's like you don't even you don't even have to do the work of thinking about how to solve the problem right it's so innately ingrained in you that it just flows yeah and that's like getting at that flow state that you're talking about and this is where gladwell's ten thousand hours comes in once you've had the ten thousand hours in a in a physical practice a skill suddenly you don't have to think about doing it anymore it just flows out of you right and yeah he, and he, so he's saying like you need to put in the time to develop that. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the time and space, you're never going to learn how to crochet or whatever it is you want to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you're learning this in your basic painting class. Like, it's about time, isn't it? It really is. But it's, it's, that, same, it's that same sort of thing where it's like, uh, what was I? I was just talking to somebody, somebody about this the other day. I was talking to somebody about, uh, about printmaking, yeah. where it's like somebody who's really good at printmaking. Like, when, you, when you're new at printmaking, so much of what you're doing is trying to figure out what layers go on top of what other layers and what colors, you know, mm -hmm. like that's like so much of the mental work. Somebody who's been doing printmaking for years doesn't need to think about that anymore. Like mm -hmm. it's second nature to them that like, well, if I want my end process to look like this, these are my four layers. These are my four, uh, my four, my four colors. And I want to do them in this order. And they're right every single time. They don't yeah, need yeah. to think about it. Well, and this is the area where earlier you mentioned the old farmers and how it's like they could do work. They didn't have to think about mm -hmm. how do I need to position myself? Where do I put my feet? How do I plant the hook or yeah. whatever it is in the farm activity? It's like all of that flows. Mm -hmm. And so they don't have to spend the few microseconds a hundred thousand times a day and so they've got 100,000 more microseconds than you. Yeah. And they fill it with more work. Yeah. And it's also the place where much of the things that Elkins is talking about comes in to Steinbach's model. Mm -hmm. He's not saying we don't need those foundation classes that yeah. are highly about building a skill. Yeah. In fact, he's saying, he, he didn't say we need to remake the whole program. He said we need a, a part of the program that does this mm -hmm. while it maintains all the other parts of the artistic program. Yep. But that's the thing is the reason Elkins is confused is because he understands how that part works. He understands how we can judge, did you, did you do the print right? Yeah. Were you able to pull 100 prints? Yep. Did they all look relatively the same? Or did you have problems and was it messy and did you mess up the print <laughs> or the, the uh, press, yeah. mm -hmm. which has happened in the past? Yeah. Um, you know, it's like, do you know how to do this? Yeah. That, that is a part of his thing. Um, and on top of that, he's like, he teaches this class to juniors and seniors mm -hmm. because the idea being that they've already received those foundations. Yeah. Hopefully they know some of those processes and then they're developing it on their own time as well. Mm -hmm. They're continuing to master a, pro a practice and hopefully they're working with, you know, other professors in those fields because mm -hmm. Steinbach is not, I mean, I think he's a drawer and printmaker. Printmaking, yeah. yeah. And he does some sculpture too, but. Yeah. Um, so he, he has that. He also has um, research, like actual research, as in reading things. Yeah. Why did why do artists need like that was one of his one of his things that he talks about across the board. Every one of the seventy five of them read. Mm -hmm. What like why is that so important? Yeah. 
Man, I think we could talk about this. As, as, two, as two lovers of books, I think we could talk about why it's important that people read so yeah. much. But um, I, I think I would bring it back probably most simply in this book to, again, that idea of, uh, of like just, just kind of the raw input and all of these different ideas. Like it's like such a concentrated form of knowledge that you're bringing in. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, it's also an embodied form of knowledge where like reading is a skill that's something that people get and we we think and we work with language so much it's like such a natural process for anybody who is uh, literate and able to speak to like take in these words and then talk about the words and write and read and journal and that back and forth yeah. is a, I think probably one of the clearest examples of embodied knowledge that we all have access to. Yeah. Um. We could talk about that for a long time. There's a great book called The Gutenberg Galaxy by Marshall McLuhan about like how fundamentally transformative a book is mm -hmm. and why even to this day our books are better learning devices than our computers mm -hmm. and our screens in particular. It has to do with how human beings function. I talk a lot about how spatial we are in design one or basic design. Um, and the book is that, like it's a spatial document. Right. Which is why it's frustrating when pages fall out because you start to dislocate space. But so many of us, like all of the people who supposedly have photographic brains, mm -hmm. like it's not true, that's not a thing. What they're doing is they, they're remembering spatial patterns. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite good at this. And that is that I can remember what side of the page and where a, a quote was. Mm -hmm. Can't remember the quote specifically. People who are really good at it the reason they can remember word for word, like I had a professor who I'm pretty sure can remember everything he's ever read. It's insane. He's a monster. <laughs> but the reason it works is because we see words as images, not as data, mm -hmm. which is why in order for him to recite, like he can't just tell you what Aquinas thinks. He has to recite the line and then reassess it because he's remembering the image, not the meaning. Mm -hmm. And that's where it's like highly visual people can have those strange, what we call photographic memories. What they are is just shape pattern recognition. But that's where it's like, reading is so fundamentally powerful and it allows you to interact with other people's thoughts at your own pace. Right, I think, uh, I think a really clear example of that for me is the difference between uh, audiobooks, where mm -hmm. audio, I really like audiobooks, right. but Audiobooks also only work for stories. Anybody who's ever tried to learn from a textbook or like that sort of informational book from an audiobook will know like it's completely useless. Like your brain yeah. just can't hold on to the information. Yeah. I remember um, trying it back when I was in science classes and like if you've ever tried to like listen to a physics book, even if it's a well-written physics book, which there are very few of them out there, you can't, you can't hold on to that information. Yeah. But you know, we're, we are, you know, oral oral storytelling traditions are really common among people. So right. we can we can keep track of a story really well if somebody tells it to us. But yeah, that's that's why all of the ancient myths are stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know that's why like the Ten Commandments comes later. But yeah, all of them are manifested through the story. Mm -hmm. You know, should you kill? It's like well, that's what Cain and Abel's about. Yeah. like you know, like should you set up an idol? That's what like. All of Exodus is about. <laughs> yeah. It's like telling us it in a story because we can remember the story. Mm -hmm. But there's, uh, that was what my last video was about really, is why we can remember stories. Yeah, we, it, it even happens, like this happens all the time with me because I'm far more visual. Um, but uh, we think and interpret slower than we hear. And so I can listen to things very fast. I listen to podcasts on 2.5. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah, like I don't retain much of it. The yeah. reason I listen to it on 2.5 is because most of what they're saying is pointless. Mm -hmm. It's like you got to wait for the good stuff. Yeah. And that's when you go back and you re-listen to it or you slow it down and you, you really focus. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the, the, even like our conversations, like there's going to be parts that people want to speed through. Yeah. But um, it also happens, you know, we frequently will say something like, what was that? And it's like, as soon as you say, what was that? It's like, then you realize what they said. Mm -hmm. It happens to all of us. Yeah. But that's because literally we hear faster than we can contemplate because our hearing saves our lives. Right. Like if that tree, that twig snaps as the panther is stepping, you need to respond to it before you think that was a twig snap. And so it's like, we, uh, we just don't have the same kind of uh, contemplative capacity 
for hearing, we have a more emotional capacity for that. That's why we love soundtracks mm -hmm. on movies. Like, because you don't actually have to think about it, you just feel it, and it's coming through your ears, and we feel through our ears. Or, or the other thing I'd point to with all that is the, um, the propensity for something that's important uh, in a, if it's happening auditorily is for it to be reported or re repeated multiple times. Like in the yeah. Hebrew language, when a word was something that you were really meant to understand, it's always said in three times. Because by the third time that something's said, you've actually yeah. understood it for the first time. Holy, right. holy, holy. Right. I know what you're saying, now you're saying holy. Or yeah. um, even in conversation, if somebody, yep. I don't know how many times I do this, but if somebody says something that's important to me, I'll say it back to them more slowly. And that's right. my way of actually listening to them. Right, and you can see like, oh, all the educational practices that are oral mm -hmm. regarding inculcation and regarding repetition. Yep. And it's like all of that, again, stemming from spiritual traditions, stemming yeah. from storytelling traditions. It's like all of that comes into it. Where, but, uh, but at its core, Steinbeck is trying to get at this idea that what these artists are doing is they're making sure that they're tapping into other ideas. Mm -hmm. And it happens to be that most successful people, in fact, all 75 of the people he interviewed, it comes in the form of reading. Mm -hmm. For the person who's dys dyslexic and can't read, it's not going to come in the form of reading. Mm -hmm. And they are going to have a harder time I mean, just in general, in our society, since, sure. since we invented books, dyslexic people are having a harder time keeping up. Yeah. And I don't like that. No. But, you know, I'll figure out how to listen to audiobooks better or something. <laughs> I, I don't know. It's, it's difficult. Yeah, no, it is. one other bit in here. Um, uh, he calls it feeding. You have to feed. So there's directed research towards specific things that may or may not pan out. But then he also talks about this sense of like, uh, I mean, I think he would define it as like pleasurable experiences, mm -hmm. um, reading things that seem completely unrelated to what you're doing. Um, why, why, like, it seems like if we're, if we're going to be focused, you're working on towards a senior capstone project. Yeah. Shouldn't you focus on that stuff? What is this whole allowing for weird distractions. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tell a brief story I'll tell about that is that we, in, uh, in my current senior level class, one of, my, one of my favorite things that we've instituted is we call it the two weeks of thought. And in the two weeks of thought, it's a one day every month or, or every, one day every two weeks where uh, you give a presentation on your current project, but that's only supposed to be a couple slides. And then what you have to do is you have to talk about every other thing that you've watched, read, or listened to mm. in the last two weeks. And mm. it's always super, super fun because it's like it's 10, it's 10 like we're art majors, we're pretty weird people, so it's like a great place to find out about weird books and movies and songs. Mm -hmm. But it's that idea exactly. And uh, when we first started talking about it, uh, the professor of the class, Lee, was said like, you need to understand that all of this stuff you're, you're taking in is all going to be showing up in your work. So like, let's actually talk about it. Let's think about it. Show it to everybody else. Show everybody the weird song that you like right now because they're going to be able to see the connections better yeah. than you can. Yeah. But that's not, that's not the only reason for it. There is this also just argument for like, you can't make something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. And if the only thing you're doing is directed research, that's not actually a great way to, to come across something new. Like, yeah, yeah. We can talk about this for a long time, remixes and creativity, but mm -hmm. the a really a really functional definition of creativity is essentially the combination of separate ideas or separate disciplines. Right. I think in the cognitive science sciences they're calling this divergent thinking these mm -hmm. days. And it's yeah. basically like, how do you make it so that you can step outside the realm you're in and and look back on it? Mm -hmm. Or how can you see connections that aren't apparent? Yeah. And that's where he's talking about that every one of these artists is in some manner engaged in something that feels completely different, but they're still attending to it, looking for connections. Mm -hmm. And like, um, it might, I think it's probably obvious to you that that's like my favorite thing to do. Mm. Yeah, everything I watch, it's always like, what does this mean? How yep. does it relate? How do I make it? You know, it's like, I'm... I am sometimes too broadly spread mm -hmm. because I would rather do this than any focused research because I'm, 
I, I might have a strange belief that actually my focused research has nothing to do with what I really need to be doing. <laughs> um, I, almost, I almost never trust my desires. Yeah. It's almost like, no, I have to be open to something else. Yeah. But that, that kind of sense of like, um, you know, like there's the very classic story about, I forget the name of the mathematician who's trying to figure out how to calculate volume. And his wife tells him to go take a bath. And he does, and when he's sitting in the water, he realizes, you know, like, because he knows it's density and mass and all this stuff doesn't work properly. You can't weigh something and say, a pound of lead will displace a pound of water. No, it won't. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to think about volume, and that's the sitting in the, into the bath, watching the water rise and realizing that's how you calculate volume. Yeah. And it's like divergent thinking. Right. It was, he literally needed to go take a bath and think about the bath in relationship to what he was working on. Mm -hmm. It's like, go watch the new you know, Barbie movie or whatever. Yeah. And think about how does it work. And it might be nothing. There might yeah. be no little thing. But sometimes you, know, you watch Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse and you realize like, man, they're doing the layering and density so well and with still a focal point, like such interesting compositions. And I'm still thinking about it, even though yeah. it's a stupid Spider-Man movie. Yeah. Um, you know, it's like those kinds of things Artists are constantly open to that, and this gets at his key thing in, in process, which is open-ended, Be, being open about the end goal. Mm -hmm. um, it's so important to have that in the artistic process right? Um, in order to find those, those new ideas. Right. It is. It's this interesting balance between like this kind of intense discipline and clarity and kind of emptiness in the studio process. And then this, on the absolute other end of the spectrum, like this willingness to just kind of like open yourself up and just be like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat everything like it's meaningful. All of this craziness that's kind of coming at me from all sides, I'm just going to take it all in and treat it all like whether it's that tree that I've noticed a couple times on my walk or like you said, this, this movie, which I didn't actually even like, but I'll, I'll, I'll see what's there. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and that this gets to, he finishes this chapter with something he calls interwoven. He says, it's not unusual to hear an artist say that they keep rereading the same texts or sources or are driven to acquire everything written about his or her subject or visit a location again and again without really knowing why. And that's just like, it's this practice of mulling things over, of chewing cud mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of the the cow with the multiple stomachs. It's like... You know, I look back on the last 13 years of my creative practice and realize, like, pretty much I'm still thinking through the same ideas. It looks drastically different, mm. but I keep returning to the same kinds of ideas over and over. And it's one of those things where it's like, um, think about the metaphors he's been using. We're creating fertile soil. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, there's a growing season, yeah. and the soil's the same. Mm -hmm. Keeps on, you know, like... You're, you keep on going back to these things, and each year, you know, the roots grow deeper. The soil, the soil grows more fertile. Mm -hmm. uh, not all years. Some years there's a blight. Yeah. And your studio, you get locked out of it because <laughs> COVID happened, and you've got eight months stuck in your basement with nothing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then you have a kind of barren year. But, yeah. Uh, but it's like this, this, again, just to continue to, to highlight the radicalness, the, or at least the radical radically different than Elkin's approach that Steinbach's taking of like this is a human thing like we do that in life yeah you know the, the creative practice is far more related to us being humans than us being artists mm -hmm. in my opinion no it is it's all of these I think I would, I would point back to to Percy with some of the stuff in the message in the bottle um and in his uh his essay the um, the Delta factor, right? Where he talks about how strange people's, uh, how strange people are. And those are, those are the qualities that, uh, that Steinbach is talking about, like kind of these weird obsessive qualities or these weird, these things that just don't seem to add up. And those are, those are the things that he kind of hones in on as actually the elements of the process and of the visual, the visual creative practice right. or any creative practice. Right. Right. And that like, um, and like you never know which little bottle will be the key to helping you understand something. Mm -hmm. um, but that gets to like his next chapter is a really weird chapter. Um, 
but he calls it embracing interaction and conflict. What, like, I, I'm especially intrigued by you as a student. Like, this is the one where he talks about fear, challenging, introducing in conflict, um, and, and getting gaining. Well, I don't. I'm not going to sum it. I'm not going to give you what I think it's about. What, like, what do you make of this chapter? <laughs> yeah, this is this is one that is like. Oh, it feels so pertinent to both me and I think probably our my entire senior class right now, where mm-hmm. it's like this is the. This is like in some ways the where we're at like such a turning point right with this class right now where it's like we're on the edge and like the question everybody's asking is like do we have what it takes sort of thing like that's the question everybody has where it's like everybody's had this semester and we had our senior critiques and interestingly enough there was like the same piece of advice was given across every every single senior critique which was like hard for people to hear Mm -hmm. um and it's left everybody with the same question, which is like, oh man, like, am I really going to be able to pull this off in the yeah. next semester? I've got one semester left yeah. to, to make a show and I'm sitting here and I don't feel like I have anything done so far. Yeah. I mean, how do you think, so it sounds like there's a lot of anxiety. Yeah. A yeah. Of a lot fear. of, I think um, a lot of anxiety, a lot of fear, a lot of people like pushing up against like the structures of the coursework, the structures of the department, the structures yeah. of like, there's just like a lot of friction right now, yeah. internal and external, which... I say everyone's looking for a scapegoat. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so when Steinbach, most of our culture right now is a culture that for, I'm not condemning this, like... Uh, I, I'm not <laughs> condemning it necessarily on the face of it for what it is. Yeah. But much of our culture is a um, seeking comfort, mm-hmm. uh, saying that you cannot function properly when you're anxious. Mm-hmm. And so we have a huge reliance on self-care mm-hmm. and mental health. And I'm not denying the, that those are important things. Right. But then, so how do you, like you, you're in that culture. You're in student, what is it called? Student... Uh, your res- resident life, oh, your residential yeah. life. Yeah. It's all yeah. of that, right? Mm-hmm. You're trying to create a, right. a second home for these students. Yeah. Then you have Steinbeck come in and say, like, no, you need to embrace the fear and anxiety. You need to take the risks. You need to embrace the discomfort. Like, isn't that flying in the face of everything that this institution is telling you to do? <sighs> yes. I think so personally, personally, I have, like, there's there's a way of justifying those two ideas which i think is like a fair stance to take which is um there are some places where stress is a really good thing there are other places where it's like obviously stress isn't where it's like as res life some of the things we look at are like does this student know how to get to the dining hall it's like okay i don't think i don't think uh, I don't think this book is arguing that having a fear of not knowing where your next meal is going to come from is always a beneficial thing in your studio practice. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. it could be. It, it, at times it could be, but not not always. Yeah. Um, I tend to agree with him strongly that there's a lot to be said for... I mean, it's a, it's a cliche idea, but the idea of like growth coming from uncomfortability, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like growth coming out of a place of challenge, even, even like in order to actually get anything done, there needs to be some level of stress, like change, change happening as a result of being unhappy enough with your current circumstances that you're willing to, to kind of take some sort right. of a bold step. Right. Um, you don't know that you can defeat the dragon unless you face the dragon right like that's and that's an important thing to do and it's also important to figure out like what does it mean if and you will inevitably lose at some point like those are those are also questions that get brought up which are uncomfortable questions nobody likes to lose and a lot of our i might say that while seeking stability and comfort aren't bad things we are our fear of losing is so our fear of losing to the dragon is so like overwhelming that it's like it won't ever allow you t- to take a single step outside of that that place like uh like the great michael scott said about wayne gretzky <laughs> exactly you miss, you miss every shot you don't take yeah um 
Right, but going going just a little bit further with that, like the the idea of searching out discomfort in the studio mm-hmm. is is a really important one. And I think so often it's the advice behind the advice that professors are giving when they say, like, do more work, right? Like it's the most common, it's the art, it's the art professor cliche. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. Make it bigger, make it bolder, push it further. Like what you're saying is take it to a point that you're not comfortable with it, where it's like you've yeah. worked so hard on it that like working on it was uncomfortable or that mm-hmm. you've taken this idea to a place where you're not even sure you agree with it anymore or... Um, make it big enough that it is wildly impractical and like a total, a total pain to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and trusting that either in the success or the failure of those steps, something might happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell students this these days. <laughs> it is. Um, it's hard to do it. It's hard to hear it as a student. Right. And I think, I mean, I would... I would assume, I I would assume even as a more established creative or an artist, like that that process, it shouldn't ever get comfortable per se, because the point of the process is putting yourself in a position where it is uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah, and that's what we're, this is one of the weirder sections of like, I think one of the, uh, of Steinbach's book, where he's talking about so much of this, we're teaching through uh, forcing the students into this. So when he's talking about, um, let me let me read his exact headings, but it's uh, um, the gifts of anxiety and fear, concurrent projects and interleaving. Mm-hmm. I think it's supposed to be interweaving, but uh, creating interaction and conflict and embracing external interaction and conflict and then unwanted interaction and conflict. So he does acknowledge that some of it is not healthy. Mm-hmm and then starting over. Right. And so many of the things are like interesting little strategies. Like you've said, make it bigger. Make more of it. Mm-hmm. Make copies of it. All of these things, and, and try it in a new medium. All of these things are strategies that creatives are doing in order to continue generating, especially once you finish a work. We just had Dan Callis as the artist in residence, mm. and he talked about how it's like when you come to the end of a body of work, his strategy a body of work is almost always about two things. And for him, since he's a painter and kind of a collage artist, it's like there's something the painting's doing and there's something the collage is doing. So take those two things, separate them out, take just the collage, yeah. and push it to another place. Mm-hmm. Take the painting, push it to another place. And you can see he's doing this to himself. Yeah, That's the biggest thing that students miss. So many students, especially when they get to the senior year, it's like, I don't know, I'm in this room that I'm supposed to call my studio and I don't know what to do. I've been told what to do. Mm-hmm. I've been told to make self-portraits. I've been told, and now you're like, make something. Yeah. And it's like, that's what we're, you're, you're learning is the practice of how are you going to do this when you don't have people to do this for you? Right. How are you going to push it? How are you going to problematize it? How are you going to embrace that little shadow in your, that little crappy part of your project that you want to ignore. Right. But it's like, that's where the next one is. And yeah. It's like, that's what the process, the, the, everyone's are, everyone's are different. Like mine is, um, so frequently mine is like destroying the thing. Mm-hmm. Like I, I have to destroy it and turn it into something else. Right. And it's like that, that practice, you know, I almost always start with drawings. Then I like, somehow figure out where the drawings are going Mm -hmm. you know like why did i start drawing stones what the heck was that about like where did that come from yeah and then it's realizing like what does this relate to and seeing like oh it's tied to that other thing i was reading over here so that's coming and it's like how do you problematize so that for yourself you're able to keep generating work Right. Yeah, I remember reading it. I actually I forget if it's in the interview section of this this book. I didn't I didn't read through every single interview. Um, but I, I read it at some point, or I heard somebody say it, where it was a painter, and she was saying that whenever she feels stuck with a painting, she chooses her favorite part of the painting, the part that she's like been defending, yep. and gessos right over it, just yep. like every single time. So like, so essentially, when she's done with a painting it's all of her least favorite parts. And yeah. 
And that's such a, such a, I mean, like to, to most people, it's like, that sounds radical or it sounds like it's a really bad painting, but to her, it's like, no, like that's how I make a good painting yeah. is I keep on wrecking my favorite part over and over and over again mm -hmm. until something emerges. Right. Yeah. You have to sacrifice your, your darlings. Yep. Yeah. You know, all the time. Yeah. And, and it's like, for me, as, as someone who's religious, I just can't help but see like, oh, this is the same practice. And in fact, I can under, if I can understand this practice more, I can understand this practice more. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, yeah. Or, All those things I build up is like the most important part of me. That's always the thing that has to go. Mm -hmm. It's like the same in the work. You build up, you're like that one piece, that part is so good. And it's like, no, that's the part that's holding the rest of it back. Mm -hmm. Every time. It's, it's <laughs> I mean, and, and we, we could go into this further. This, this, uh, this conversation has a lot of sub podcasts or sub conversations, yeah. but it's like the recurring biblical or even just mythological theme in general of uh, of sacrificing your child right mm -hmm. like this even i think we could go to to neumann and archetypes with it the idea of like what does that mean to be willing to give up everything and get to the point where like you've hit the point of no return and then, and then it changes at that last second, right? The story of Abraham and Isaac, or Jesus on the cross, or mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact the exact name, but there's a really similar myth in Egyptian mythology, yeah. um, with with that that same dynamic to it. Yeah. Well, so he 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 has chapter seven and eight, which are great interviews, mm -hmm. his syllabi, basically. Yep. But chapter six really is, I think, the end of the book in the sense of everything he's saying. Yeah. And it's, I, I don't think we need to talk too much about it because I highly recommend people get this book and read it. But it's just called The Process is the Product. Mm -hmm. and I just want to like point out like how radically, like, if you hold to Elkin's idea of what education is, then yeah, you can't teach this. Mm -hmm. But if you understand that people have been passing down practices like this through, for every human generation. Yeah. They're not necessarily rational, but they are active and they are things that you can learn and there are things you can model. And the reality is, is that there's, it's a weird, complex, strange thing that happens to largely map onto what life is. Yeah. And it happens to get at the same thing of like, uh, I have a line in my studio written on the, I can't remember exactly who said it, but it's um, all good dirt is made up of mostly dead things. Hmm. It's like, the process of tilling the soil, making it what it is, involves sacri you know, putting dead things down in there, mm -hmm. tilling it over, giving it time, feeding it, watering it, doing all the different things, mm -hmm. aerating it. You yeah. know a lot about aerating and tilling soil. Yeah. And all of that is necessary in order for anything to grow out of it. And the weirdest thing is, like I, I can't explain it rationally, but the people who start to get this down inevitably things grow. Mm -hmm. I haven't met a single person who can do the practice and nothing comes out of it. Mm -hmm. Some people, not much comes out of it, but something still comes out of it. Yeah. And lo oftentimes, it's so much better than that person could have imagined. Mm -hmm. Like I, I talk about this a lot about the kinds of artists, because there are people who are commercially successful who function in that more design realm. Yeah. I don't mean they're designers, but they're they're doing that kind of, this is my problem, make this, make this, make this, and they achieve that. Um, it's not, it's like they can't, uh, the way I've, I've described it in the past is saying they can't make something that's smarter than them. Hmm. It's like my work is way ahead of me. Hmm. I have no idea where it's going. <laughs> and I'm more surprised by it than probably most people. Yeah. And... And that, like, that's why I love it. I can't stop doing it. Like, yeah. I hate it. I wish that I could, like, just have the thing I need. Instead, it's like, but then, especially the days when I'm in there and, you know, time goes away and I just can't stop thinking and, like, doing and seeing new things emerging. Inevitably, the next day I come in, I'm like, oh, that's all garbage, <laughs> except for that one thing yeah. over there. But it's like... It is just this, it's an enchanting process that is more revelatory than it is me expressing myself. Mm -hmm. It's far more 
if if I if there's any self-expression in it, I'm discovering what my self-expression is as I'm going through it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, when you when you so like you've read this book before, you've met Ken, we've now had this conversation. What are you what do you as a student think you're supposed to do with this thing? Yeah. I, I mean in some ways it's such a it feels like it should be like uh, required reading in so many we'll see. We're at one fifty seven. One fifty seven. Oh, we said two thirty, right? Yeah, we're good. Um, it feels like it should be required reading in so many ways because for one it is actually like really pretty prescriptive where <clears throat> one of the <clears throat> one of the things that he does is he, he lays out really like the process, even though there's these elements to it that are kind of magical, it's like the steps to get there aren't that complicated. It's like they're difficult, but they're not that complicated. Like get your desk, get a timer, the, like, and, and trust that something will happen there if you'll actually put in yeah. time to it. Which that's the torturous part. The right. torturous part is the time. Yeah, yeah. And especially like, I mean, we could it's like time is hard to come by time is really valuable and like it's uh it gets back to that idea of i mean i said i said trust it but like it's really hard to trust it's really hard to be like oh yeah like something will come with this if i spend enough time at it like you're so if like what if you put 60 hours into something and it's nothing and and the other thing that's hard is that like sometimes a part of the process is putting 60 hours into something and then having it be nothing, like, yeah. and being okay with that anyways. Like, that's, that sucks. One might say that it starts with faith. Right. And if you don't have faith, or, or if the faith does not have works, then the faith might as well be dead. <laughs> I think that would be a really, uh, a really good way of putting it. I think... I, I hope he's working on this book. I hope every day that he's working on this book. But during his, his artist lecture, uh, Steinbach said that he was, that he considered this, this kind of creative process was like, like essentially him explaining the basis of his theology. And he intended to flesh out the ideas more and write a theologian's book. Right. And I'm always waiting. I'm always, always, you know, I have, have my Google alert set up for his name, hoping that someday some new book will come out. But. I'm sure it will. I hope so. He's making great artwork too. Really, I haven't looked he, recently. Uh, when he showed his his work, uh, he was talking about those money ones. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's like he he is intuiting what crypto has done to currency. I don't know if it's that meaningful, but mm-hmm. it's intriguing because he's like, I don't understand what cryptocurrency is. And then he makes artwork that is a perfect manifestation of what cryptocurrency is. <laughs> but, but to be fair, the, the, the twist to it and the genius twist to it is that he's also he's giving it away for free. I don't know if you remember that part of his yeah. artist talk, but that's like one of, the, one of the funniest parts of it is that at the end of these shows, he's just like literally just passing it out as fast as he can. And he says people just don't understand what he's doing. People are like... Is this a trick? Am I on camera? What are you doing here? And it's no, he's just, he's actually giving away the art at the end of it. But yeah, very bizarre. That's probably where it should end. I think so. Thanks for talking. Yes, indeed.